So Cricket Life Stories with me, Neil Kagram. Today we're joined by Ian Blackwell. Ian, how's things going? Yeah, not too bad, Neil. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. No, great to have you. So let's start where it all began for yourself. What first attracted you to cricket? Uh, I'd probably have to say my father. He was um, fairly cricket mad and um, from the age of probably five or six, I would follow him to cricket games and uh, cause some mischief around around the clubs that he used to play for um, in Wingerworth, um, which is sort of North Derbyshire. Um, that was very early on, so I was quite young at the time. And when did your talents first get spotted in terms of getting into the Derby setup? Um, it would have been around eight. I think I, I represented the under-11s at the age of eight, um, only a couple of times, but I think I was recognised from a quite an early age um, and it sort of grew from there into the 11s and then Derbyshire schools and onwards. Were you always an all-rounder? A bold seam, believe it or not. Um, left arm seam, probably up until I was about 16 and then realised that I probably wasn't going to make a career out of uh, bowling left arm seam. Um, and someone said, have you tried bowling spin? And you know, it happened in a few league games and it went quite well. So I'd sort of uh, progressed with the spin and you know, kept working on the batting as well. And what did it mean to you to kind of make your first team de uh, debut for, for Derbyshire, obviously coming through the ranks? What did it mean to you? I think at the time it meant everything. And um, all I wanted to do was play for Derbyshire. And growing up, it's, you know, your childhood dream. Um, certainly as a, as a cricketer, you know, football was probably a, the next uh, second sport for me. But I decided cricket was probably the, the best avenue. Um, and it made it more special that I made my debut at Chesterfield, which um, was the club that I grew up from the age of 14 playing at. So, you know, that was really special to make my one day debut there. How would you sum up your time with Derbyshire? So I look back at some stats some scorecards. I saw that a lot of your games that you actually played was away from home. Now, I think, like, obviously, I was, or then I read a bit further into it and then I was seeing that a lot of wickets were kind of more seam-friendly. Was that frustrating for you? Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, any cricketer growing up, you just want sort of equal opportunity of playing. And Derby at the time, they had a battery of seamers with De Freitas, Malcolm, Harris, Dean, Cork. Um, and for me, they played on green seamers and I generally played away from home. And, you know, if, if we did have a, a dry spell, then I might get the odd, odd game at home. But like you say, the majority were away from home. Um, and I, I guess, wanted to play regularly. Um, thought I was probably good enough to play regularly. And although Derbyshire did have a very good side back in the day, um, and I was, you know, looking back, I was very privileged to actually play on that side. Um, but for me, I wanted regular first-team cricket. And, um, you know, with the ambition of playing for England, I had to move. And then the move to Somerset, how did that come about in 2000? What were the initial conversations yeah, did you have um, with? That was with Dermot Reeve. Um, played a, a, I think it was a was a CB40 game or an AXA equity and law game. Um, and that was down at Somerset. And we didn't do very well, but I think me and Matt Kassar uh, put on 200 um, in one partnership. And I got 86 quite quickly and... Um, Dermot obviously spotted something um, in, in the way I played and he next fixture we played at Derby pulled me to one side and you know sort of I obviously knew him and respected him as a player and a coach and you know it was quite exciting to to hear that someone else actually valued you um, and obviously sad that nobody perhaps valued me the same at Derby. And then in 2001 trophy success 2002 runners-up uh, in the in the cup, then England came in two thousand and two Champions Trophy call up. Was it replacing Andrew Flintoff? Is that how it all came about? What was what were the talks with the selectors, the communications, <clears throat> and how did you feel when you got the call? Yeah, I, th I think they they called it a like for like replacement, but there's no way that I could bowl ninety miles an hour. Um, but being being as it was in the subcontinent in Sri Lanka. Uh, they felt that I could obviously provide 10 overs of spin and um, could hopefully be as equally as um, destructive with the bat. So I got a, a random, I think we were playing at Lords when I got told um, that, you know, you're going to be a late replacement for Andrew Flintoff in this Champions Trophy. And 
yeah, it was a strange, strange day, um, but obviously a, a very good day in the end. Also, I read somewhere, but I'm not sure if it's true or not. So maybe you, know, cl- you can clarify. Did was there was there a game where you kind of whacked Matthew Hoggard around, and then Duncan Fletcher just happened to be in the stand or something? Is that is there a story in there? Somewhere? Yeah, that's yeah, that was a true story. Um, I can't remember. It was a championship match. I don't even know Duncan Fletcher was there, um, and Hoggy was obviously um, the in and out of the England side at the time. Um, I'd obviously been making a few strides and. We had a few words out on the field, but nothing, you know, derogatory or it was just a, he didn't think I could play and he kept trying to trying to hit me on the head. So uh, playing at Taunton on flat wickets with short boundaries, that probably wasn't the smartest move. Um, and I think for 28 in one over, um, you know, in a championship match, that's, you know, few and far between when that happens. So I think Duncan Fletcher obviously saw that and obviously thought there was something there as well. And then when you made your debut in the Champions Trophy against Zimbabwe, when you got the cap, A, how did it make you feel the proudest moment of your career? And did you feel ready as well at the making the step up to the international stage? I don't know if I ever felt I was ready. I, I don't know what that feeling is supposed to feel like because every time you know I play county cricket, there was butterflies, there was nervousness, there was that what if and am I good enough? Um all those sort of things creep into your, your mind, um, certainly as a youngster. And I guess it was slightly surreal as I turned up to the airport and they gave me uh, Dominic Cork's blazer to wear for the for the trip, um, which was kind of ironic since I left Derbyshire um, a few years back. And, you know, he was probably one of the reasons why I left. So to get his uh, blazer was slightly ironic. Um, but yeah, it was a bizarre feeling. But you know, something that until you've tried it, you you don't know that if you, if you're good enough or not. But you've just got to back yourself, and you know that's what I did in the first few games. You mentioned the nerves there. For any youngster perhaps watching this, is there any advice that you can give now that your career's over? You know, looking back, could you've coped with the nerves a little bit better if a youngster came to you and said any advice? What would what would it be? What would you say? Uh, I think. You just got to harness the nerve. They're, they're normal. If you haven't got nerves and you haven't got that feeling of, you know, of not necessarily fear, but of the unknown, then there's there's probably something wrong with you because nowadays, you know, that that's the norm. And I think that um, to have those uh, feelings is is completely natural, and it's the way people deal with them, and not to necessarily, you know, crumble and be fearful, but to actually. And I think the youth are, are more inclined to hit the ground running now than when I was um, 18, 19, because the youth just don't seem to to give a monkeys. They come into the side, it doesn't matter who they're playing against, that's all right, I'll whack him for four, you know, and, and I see that as an umpire now, and it's kind of uh, good in a way, but I also think maybe should I have taken that approach? I know I tried, and, you know, probably I was probably two or three years behind where I probably would have liked to have been, where, where some of the youngsters are now. Then out of the 34 one days you played, was it, am I correct to say 32 were actually played away from home? And there, it, there yeah. was over a span of, ten, like, was it nine or ten tours as well? Uh, ten tours, I think ten it tours, was, yeah. Ten tours. So in terms yeah. of getting a run in the side, that obviously didn't happen. How would you reflect back then on your England career? Do you think it could have been better in terms of performance if you were given a run in the side? Do you feel you were backed? How do you reflect? Yeah, I, I probably think that um, I had opportunities, without a doubt. Duncan Fletcher gave me uh, numerous opportunities to play. Um, and I think the, my first tour I went on with England was for five five months and three weeks Um, because I went out to the academy um, out in Adelaide and then I got called up. This was straight after the uh, Sri Lanka uh, replacement for Andrew Flintoff. So I went from there to Adelaide onto the BB series. Couldn't come home because we were then going to uh, the World Cup 2003 and then home. So I think I ended up playing, I think it was the best part of 15 ODIs in the first stint away because I think the BB series was something like nine or ten um, or eight I think I played something like that 
and I've played three in uh, Sri Lanka. And then obviously the World Cup, I played three again, I think, before I had a back spasm and didn't play in the rest of the group game. So you could say I had a run uh, there, um, but I never felt part of the team. It was, I was playing for my next fixture. Uh, if I do well, then great, because I'll play again. Maybe the wrong way to look at it, but maybe the setup's changed now and people do feel like they're part of the squad and they're backed for a series or a certain amount of games where I think it was slightly different back in the early 2000s. And you mentioned the VB series there. How was it playing in Australia? Big crowds, hostile? Brutal, yeah. It's by far the longest 50 over games I've ever played because against the you know, world-class Australian side at the time, you name it, every player was a superstar. Um, they expected to win every game. England, you know, were there, there to be beaten, although we were better than Sri Lanka. You know, we lost the final, I think, 3-0 or 2-0. Um, and I never forget walking out to, to the MCG with 86,000 people there and you're looking around going, this is just insane. And trying to run away from having to go down to field at Bay 13, I remember distinctly going out onto the field and trying to walk to the opposite end of the ground to see if I can get a, a fielding spot somewhere in the less hostile part of the ground. And then back home, 2005, finals day with Somerset. How was that as a day? And then it's known for Graham, uh, Graham Smith's knock. How was he as a skipper as well? He was he was phenomenal. The first time I'd ever come across somebody so young, so confident, who spoke with complete authority when he stood up, everyone sat down and shut up. And um, to come into a side that, take it, we were, we were bottom of Division 2, I think, at the time. Uh, not a, a great four-day side. He comes in, he seems to you know, vitalise everybody and rejuvenate them. And, you know, he appreciated each and every one of us. And as uh, a club, we only had youngsters that he completely backed. Um, we all had a, a cracking run in the side. And, you know, we, we were just told to go out and express ourselves. And it did help having someone at the top of the innings that could get us off to good starts because then we could work around him. And, you know, it's a fantastic year to, to play cricket and, you know, to, to come away with a trophy with the side that we had, you know, with a few old boys, it was generally youngsters, um, was just, a you know, a great for the club and obviously the young lads that were, you know, getting a torrid beating throughout 2005. And in terms of his captaincy, it's interesting he said, like, how much of an influence he had, like, off the field as well? Did he influence, like, training or was it just literally a case of when he came to selection and then just kind of backing the players wholeheartedly? Can you go a bit deeper in terms of his actual influence? Yeah, I think, I mean, he, off the field, he was um, completely different. He was laid back. He was, you know, I remember one of my best mates, he just lives around the corner from the ground. Um, and we just went round for a barbecue. Graham Smith came and my mate didn't know he was coming. And it was just like, my God, Graham Smith's here. What, what's going on? And that's the sort of guy that he was. He would do anything for anybody, um, you know, like to beer and socialise, but, as soon as cricket time came, he was just, you know, a, a man with a mission and he knew exactly what he wanted and, and how things were going to pan out for him. And, you know, it was a fantastic to, to witness things unfold that he'd actually say would happen. And, you know, just a great guy and a great tactician as well. And then 2006, the test call-up comes. Playing the first test against India in Nagpur. Again, how was that as an experience and, you know, looking back, you've got the one cap, anyone that represents their country is phenomenal. But do you feel as if that, you know, you want to, you, you deserved uh, further caps? How do, again, how do you reflect on the uh, back at that time? It's, I think 2005, I got back into the ODI side and went away to Pakistan and did really well with the ball. Didn't get many runs, but did enough. But coming in late on, and then obviously the um, Pakistan followed the obviously the Indian tour followed, and I didn't know I was going to, for the tests. Uh, I was basically hoping I was going to get another ODI call. And then they said, "Well, Ashley Giles has got a, a hip problem. We may need you to to come out and cover and then stay on for the uh, for the ODIs." So I didn't know until two days before they were flying whether or not I was going to join the test side, and um, and it 
came literally to the day before and got the phone call to say you, you're going to go as as replacement for Ashley Giles. Um, and then, you know, I didn't know if I was going to be on the ODI tour at the end of it either, because um, things obviously, you know, were, were told later on. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was, I had no preparation, which was probably good. Um, I could just go out there. It felt like last chance saloon for me, um, getting back into the side. And I wanted to, to grab things with both hands. And, you know, the warm-up games went really well and obviously got into the, the first test side. Um, and then didn't really get much of a, a go with the ball and I only batted once. So it was a not a game to forget. But, you know, apart from getting my cap, nothing really um, happened for me that, that test. Would you say your game at that stage was more suited to the longer form or the or the shorter form one day? I, w- I would say the longer form. Um, for me, I used to love four-day cricket. For me, one-day cricket, I was expected to go in and whack it from ball one, but I always felt that that just doesn't happen. You know, yes, you can get away with it a few times, but for me, I used to go out to bat, you know, 50 for four or whatever and look back and there'd be three slips, a gully, keeper, and I'm thinking there's all these gaps everywhere. You know, there's no sweet men on the offside. There's no long on, long off or deep square there might have been. But for me, I had opportunities to score. And for me, I was positive and I backed myself. And, you know, I, I far more enjoyed four-day cricket than than one day, certainly with the success that I had. But I also enjoyed one-day cricket as well because of the crowds that came in and enjoyed at Taunton. And then back home, that 2008-9 season, Justin Langer's at the helm at uh, Somerset. How was the contrast with Graham Smith's leadership? And obviously, that also coincided you uh, with you leaving the club. Was that, again, difficult? How did that come about, your move to, to Durham? Yeah, it was a really, really tough period for me. Um, obviously, Graham Smith uh, was a breath of fresh air, someone that you could you know, almost see as a mate as well as obviously a, uh, a partner on the field. Um, whereas Justin Langer seemed the complete opposite. The club, yes, we're, we're in disarray. Um, we were bottom of Division 2 and something needed to change. He was very autocratic. He tried to get everybody doing the same thing. Um, and that just doesn't work in cricket. And, you know, as he did some good things, don't get me wrong, but I think he's probably a lot better now as a coach than when he first started at Somerset. And, you know, you, you've got to treat people with respect differently. Um, and I found the way he did things wouldn't have helped my game. Certainly, if I didn't get any runs, he'd expect you to go and do press-ups and sit-ups and go in the gym. And I'm like, well, I've actually got to go and bowl 25 overs now. So if I go in the gym and do weights, I'm not going to be able to lift my arm, not going to be able to bowl properly. And that will be detrimental for the side. So he probably felt that was detrimental to what he was trying to do at the club. And, you know, we just sort of rubbed rubbed in the wrong direction, I guess. And um, for all the good that he did at the club, it was, you know, he obviously saw me as someone that felt like I was going against what he was trying to do. And, you know, but all felt that it was best that I go and play somewhere else. And then Durham, how did uh, that that come about? The move there in terms of who approved, did someone approach you uh, from the club? How, how did it go? Yeah, I mean, I I still had two years left, so the club obviously um, let me talk to other people, um, and then obviously Durham came in. I think Knotts and a few other clubs, and you know, I I really liked what Durham were doing at the time. Yes, it was it was a long way, probably too far in the end, but. Um, you know, they were moving forwards. They had a great side. They'd just won the uh, championship uh, in 2008. Um, and they wanted to keep getting better. And to sign me, you know, was a, not only, a, I think, a, a good thing for me and my self-esteem at the time, um, you know, being picked up by the, the county championships and championship side in 2008 was obviously a, a great thing to, for me to move on to. Yeah, so they won the champ. You guys won the championship again in two thousand and nine. You personally, looking at some stats, averaging over forty with the bat and with the ball, you're getting your wickets at twenty odds. Again, was that yeah. just like you know, you know, again, like a one of those things where you were kind of showing Somerset like how great, how good you were at the same. Yeah, I, yes, no, I, yeah. 
I mean, obviously, since I left, I, I felt I needed to obviously not prove what I could do because people knew what I could do, but just to prove I could go and do it somewhere else and that, you know, they they hopefully thought twice about letting me go. And, um, yeah, f- for me, it was great playing up there with a team that wanted you to to do well and obviously everybody to do well. I mean, when I averaged, I think I got 900 knob runs first year, um, you know, to get the players player of the year or the supporters player of the year as well. That just meant, you know, everything. And, you know, to be in a successful side where I think we averaged fielding about 50 overs every innings and we averaged batting 100 overs every innings. That just says that, you know, you're in a, a quality side. And, you know, I love playing up there. It was probably the, the most enjoyable first couple of years up in Durham that I've had in, you know, all my career. And then again, fast forward a few years. In 2012, you were loaned to Warwickshire and then you actually win the champ- uh, the, the championship there. How did that uh, all come about again? Um, I think at the time I was being eased out of the T20 side. Um, Paul Collingwood came back from England and wanted to bat six in the championship. Um, so that sort of was a double whammy for me, really. Um, the club were looking to offload some of the higher earners. Um, I then had a shoulder up at the end of that year. But during the season, Collingwood came back and I got pushed to second team cricket. Um, Warwickshire came in and I initially said no. And, you know, I'm glad I had a rethink. And I thought, well, for the last six, seven weeks of the season, it could be my last six, seven weeks then why not go to, you know, a club like Warwickshire and they were looking for somebody to replace Jean Patel that was going to be away uh, with New Zealand for three of the last four games, I think it was. Um, so, yeah, I ended up going and, and playing there for five weeks and loved every minute of it. What advice would you give for uh, all-rounders, you know, youngsters or like current cricketers in terms of kind of balancing, you know, in terms of, Concentrating on, on both both skill sets, dedicating enough, dedicating enough practice to both, in terms of mindset as well, if one is going better than the other. How you know, if any, if someone came up to you for some nuggets of advice, what would what would you what would you give? I think first and foremost, if you are equally as good at batting and as bowling, you know, don't worry, there will be periods where you're better at batting than you are at bowling. Certainly if you're a spinner, you'll get different opportunities throughout a summer regarding pitches and weather and your opportunities to bowl overs. So I think as long as you're prepped and you're hitting enough balls and you're bowling and doing the right preparation, that if you are called upon in a game, that you know that you're mentally ready. Um, but, you know, other than that, just try and enjoy yourself because if you're not enjoying the game and, you know, why why we're doing the hard yards and we're, we're doing all the practice. So do things with a smile on your face, but make sure that, you know, you you putting enough time in but if you need to prioritize one over the other then you know that's also okay and then when retirement came was umpiring always on the agenda how did you go into it yeah I I had nothing to fall back on other than cricket really so for me cricket was everything I wanted to stay in the game um coaching I'd done my level three in 2007 so I had something there just in case as a as a backup as a coach um, but I knew that ultimately that's not where the desire was. Um, and I think that's when I got left out the Durham T20 side, that's when I pursued uh, some league cricket in Durham. Um, it was a time when we had four or five Saturdays on the trot where the T20s would just take a whole chunk. Um, so I did three or four league games and I absolutely loved it. Um, so then I went on and did my level one and two umpires um, exams and, um, yeah, put my name forwards with Chris Kelly to to get some development stuff and then ultimately some second team stuff. What's the most difficult aspect of umpiring? And then how do you contrast it? Do you think that having played the game at the highest level, does that do you think it assists you or is it literally two different um, <clears throat> skills, jobs, etc.? No, it's definitely a plus. Um, and one thing I learned very quickly is you can't please everybody. Um, because, you know, for every decision you give, it it's for somebody and it's obviously against somebody. So you're never going to please everybody. Um, I think ultimately playing gave me a great start um, in umpiring because I had that instant respect 
by people because I'd been a you know a pretty good cricketer throughout my career. Um, so maybe it gives me a bit bit of leeway. Um, but I think ultimately it, it can't can't hurt if you played a, a decent amount of cricket and decent standard as well because you get to know the ins and outs of what little noises sound like and whether it's iPad, whether it's an edge, and you've just got that, you know, awareness of, of what's going on, which, you know, really helps you in umpiring. What are your views on technology coming into the game? And obviously now as an umpire, is that something that you embrace? What are your views on it? Yeah, I think, yeah, for me, I think so. Um, I don't want it to come to the stage where we're just counting to six. I think that, you know, for me, technology used in the right way, I think uh, can only benefit the game. Um, and, you know, ultimately we want the right decisions in, in cricket and to see somebody's career potentially end because of, you know, a mess up with either a decision or something that could have easily been, you know, rectified with um, replays or technology then, I think providing we, we're using it in the right way, um, I, I see, you know, technology is quite a vital part of, of keeping cricket, you know, going smoothly. And in terms of your own personal ambitions, <clears throat> do you have aspirations to make it all the way to the to the elite panel? Is that the end goal for you? Or are you just going to take yeah, it I, as it comes? I think as, as a cricketer, I wanted to, you know, play for England. So as an umpire, why would I just want to umpire county cricket? Um, for me, it would be great to, to do the bigger games and, you know, on big stages. And that's where you, you get the thrills from. I remember my first um, T20 match on Parham when there was, I think, 8,000 8, down at uh, Brighton. And, you know, it's the first time since retiring that I got, you know, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up because of, you know, the cheers and the crowd and the buzz of actually, you know, repeating something that you remember fondly and, you know, so for me, going up to the next level, I'll, I'll try my best to, to get there and improve as, as each year as I umpire. And then again, would you? is there something that you would encourage fellow uh, cricketers that are retiring from the game to kind of go into umpiring? Because you don't really see that transition too much. Yourself, Alex Wolf, just off the top of my head. But in terms of the waves, it's generally the path. If they're going to stay in, the, stay in cricket, they go into coaching as opposed to umpiring. Yeah, we've got a few good lads coming through now. So there's James Middlebrook. Um, I think James Treadwell's on that path. Jack Chantry. Um, there's obviously Tom Lungley from Derby. Um, so that there's quite a few. Rob White from North Ants. So there are a few that are making strides, you know, hot, hot on my heels, should we say. So it's good to see the ex-players. And what I would just say to people is, you never know. You might think umpiring's boring. You might think, you know, you're in the field all day. Yes, you are. But it, it's a great way of staying in the game and giving something back. Certainly, that was so good to me over the, the 16, 17 years that I played. So for me, I'm, I am enjoy every time I umpire. It's brilliant. Perfect. Ian, thank you very much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Fantastic going through your career and all the best for the months and years ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on now. So Neil Kagram, Cricket Last Stories, Ian Blackwell, thank you.